mic. I don't sound any louder. That's for the uh, video camera. Uh, our speaker today, as you can see, is Gene Kim. He's the Chief Technical Officer for Tripwire. For those of you who are not familiar with the history of this, I'll, I'll give you a few words of introduction. A uh, number of years ago, when I was a uh, uh, much younger faculty member, uh, I was approached by an undergraduate student who was looking for a project. and. Uh, I had gotten uh, glowing recommendations from, uh, about this student from people who had encountered him other places, uh, said how imaginative and inventive this person was and, and uh, uh, what a real find and I should, I should get him involved in some of my research. And I did. But that's a different story. Let me tell you about Gene. Uh, <laughs> uh, Gene uh, was looking for, for something else to do other than classwork. And I uh, had been coping with some break-ins to systems on campus at the time where the intruder had been altering system files and libraries to provide backdoors into the system and had been changing the modification times on the files and changing the checksums so it wasn't possible to tell what had happened using any of the standard tools we had available. And this series of break-ins has since been documented in a book called At Large uh, by Mann and Friedman, and if you haven't read the book, it's an interesting read. But we were looking for some mechanism that we could use to determine what had been changed on a system and to, to alert us when a break-in had occurred. So I had played around a little bit with the design, uh, but it needed some validation. And so Gene was the perfect patsy, uh, experimenter, to uh, come along at the time. And so I gave the project to him. And over the next year and a half, two years, and three incompletes. Um, actually, I think it was only two, but nonetheless, uh, Gene did a marvelous job of testing this, of building up the algorithms, doing some of the research, doing a lot of software engineering, um, messing up systems at Puck that got him in trouble, but th those got fixed, and turned it into the Tripwire tool, which was eventually released and is, uh, by some accounts, still the most widely used security tool uh, in the world today. So we're very pleased when uh, Gene agreed to come back and to give this seminar. Tripwire Security Systems is the company that's now commercialized this and is building a number of other very interesting products. Uh, he's going to talk to us about some of the experiences with Tripwire. And he still has a lot of the characteristics of when he was a student because last night we went to pick him up at the airport and the plane arrived at 7.30. It was two degrees outside. Gene had no coat, no gloves, no hat did have a sweater, uh, and his comment was, um, is it cold here? Do I need the sweater? <clears throat> so without much further ado, I'd like to introduce Mr. Memory himself, Gene Kim. All right. Uh, see, this seems hardly fair because I remember giving a paper at the uh, Application Developer Conference. Um, it must have been 92. And I remember actually thinking ahead a little bit and trying to think about how to pack. And on the website it said, you know, 15 degrees, and this was in Toronto, Canada. So I remember getting off the plane with you know, a suitcase full of sweaters and jackets. And it turns out it was 15 degrees Celsius not uh, 15 degrees Fahrenheit. So I, I just can't get it right. <clears throat> I was trying to think of some interesting things to talk about for this presentation. And I think the timing is actually very, very good. Uh, we're actually going through some interesting thought processes at Tripwire uh, involving open source, Linux. Hey, Gene. Uh, and uh, a lot of it has been a significant departure from uh, the thinking that has built the company from essentially two people to 70 people now. So I'm going to walk you through Tripwire history and tell you about some of our expectations going in, uh, some of the successes, and also some of the things that we didn't quite expect. And some of them were actually quite bizarre. Um, one of the issues that we're starting to grapple with is this notion of open source, the cathedral versus the bizarre that uh, Eric Raymond put forth. And I'm going to try to 
give you some of the data points that uh, we've gathered the last eight years and see if that alters your opinions about the cathedral versus the bazaar. I'm also going to talk about some open source opportunities and risks that we see. And uh, listen, if you, I, in some of these things, uh, I'm trying to be, uh, state some opinions. If you have any counter opinions, please write them down. And uh, actually, I'd like to leave enough space at the end uh, so you know, we can actually have an open forum about this. So uh, that would be the last slide discussion. <clears throat> uh, just, I have a couple slides about Tripwire for those of you who aren't familiar with the tool. Uh, it was originally released in uh, 1992 on the mm, fifth anniversary of the Morris Internet Warm incident. Uh, it was written by myself and Gene Spafford, and over the last eight years, it's become widely used and widely deployed. Uh, a good indication of that is that you go to the CERT webpage, and uh, part of the you know, uh, series of best practices that they recommend is you know, backing up, installing security patches, and running Tripwire. A uh, good way of describing what Tripwire does is that it monitors files for unauthorized changes. So, you know, files change all the time, but certain files change in only very specific ways. For example, system files shouldn't change except for, you know, when you meaningfully do it by installing security patches. Uh, log files change all the time, but they only change in very specific ways. Specifically, they, you expect them to grow. Uh, if you find your log files shrinking or vanishing, you know, that's something you want to know about. So, essentially, Tripwire will build a baseline database and scan a file system for unauthorized changes. We originally designed it for intrusion detection. Uh, we say that because uh, one of the classic MOs of uh, an attacker is that they will break into the system somehow and then plant back doors. Most intrusion detection tools are based on uh, you know, known attacks, and because we're integrity-based, we detect attacks regardless of how they are made. Uh, the application that most of our customers get the most benefit from is what we're calling damage assessment recovery. In the case that there's been a break-in, uh, often you have a data center manager or a system administrator whose job is to get that server up. The, uh, now the industry lingo is five nines, 99.999 percent uptime. That's 30 sec 37 seconds of allowed downtime per month. Uh, you know, that's not, that makes each press, uh, second very precious. So, you know, the ability to quickly, you know, determine what the scope of damage is and, you know, be able to get a list of tampered files is basically a to-do list for recovery. So if it saves them having to investigate and diagnose, then that's very, very valuable. Uh, forensics, you know, there's a notion of a camera at a crime scene. And if you think about a tripwire database, it's essentially a snapshot of file system. Uh, so there are many uses where it's very nice to have a very specific but compact snapshot of a computer file system, and Tripwire plays that role well. Policy conformance uh, is interesting. Uh, we were able to tap a lot of Y2K budgets last year. Uh, you know, the motivation is that <clears throat> you have a lot of critical business processes that run on all sorts of machines. Some of them that, uh, you know, these mainframes that uh, someone hasn't even touched in, say, you know, years and years and years. Uh, and yet they have to be able to certify that each machine or each server that the business processes run on uh, are going to behave predictably when uh, the clock struck January 1. So often the end result was the placement of a blue sticker that says, Hi, I'm Y2K ready, uh, which was only put on the machine after the machine was thoroughly audited. Uh, where they made sure that every, you know, the underlying platform and software packages uh, were Y2K certified. The problem is, how do you know if someone hasn't changed the machine after the blue sticker goes on the box? So they use Tripwire to lock down and enforce, um, enforce the Y2K lockdown. Uh, a brief timeline of uh, Tripwire releases. Uh, it was re originally released in 1992. In June of 98, we obtained the Tripwire license from Purdue University um, as Tripwire uh, Security Systems. <clears throat> we renamed the product that we worked on at Purdue uh, the Academic Source Release. Um, our intent was to make it not free and to somehow denigrate it just a little bit so we could position the commercial product uh, as you know, the better one and yet somehow not damage the Tripwire name. Um, in January '99, we shipped our first commercial product, uh, which we, yeah, we wrote, we wrote from the ground up to uh, give it some uh, legs to take us where we thought we wanted to take the company. In 
April 99, we shipped a, a version for Windows NT. And last month, we re-released all the versions uh, to basically give the roadmap for tech, which is the Tripwire Enterprise Control Manager, and I'll show some screenshots of that. But uh, so as of now, we support something like eight different Unix platforms in Windows NT, and we're now shipping a centralized reporting and control manager. You know, to give you an idea of uh, where we've invested our efforts is ease of management, ease of reporting, ease of installation. Uh, you know, one of the biggest, I would say, risks of running Tripwire, one of the biggest problems of, uh, with running, running Tripwire is that you had to store all your critical files on read-only media you know, to prevent an attacker from breaking into the system and then tampering with the underlying snapshot or the policy files. <clears throat> there was a well-publicized, well, it was, there was a known uh, attack on an ISP, it was Route 66, where uh, someone had used some well-known exploit, you know, got the root prompt, uh, you know, planted the root kits, the backdoors, um, and you know, then proceeded to type vi etsy db tripwire, and you know, change the database file to match the tampered files. So the system administrators got a false sense of security that everything was okay just because tripwire said it was okay, despite all the you know banners and the README and the documentation, uh, you know Usenet postings. You know they still forgot to put uh, the critical files on, say, a CD-ROM or on a floppy. So that that was a risk, and we now mitigate that by allowing uh, you to cryptographically sign uh, these critical files, so you can get uh, some sense of security that no one can tamper without the files. They have to have the secret. Um, Configuration files, uh, you can now modify, you know, before you would have to change a header file to change the way uh, certain con you know, configuration settings. Uh, now it's in a, you know, say like a windows.any file as opposed to um, you know, having to recompile. Uh, <clears throat> where, you know, where else uh, we invested effort was making it so Tripwire could do more report interpretation as opposed to the system administrator. Um, so we enhanced the policy language so you could annotate, you know, these rule sets uh, with things like, you know, owners, severity, you know, a pe person to be notified by email in the case of a violation. So it matches the way an IS department typically works. So you don't have the, say, system administrator being paged at 2 a.m. because the webmaster changed a file. You can actually delegate certain uh, areas of responsibility based on uh, where it lives in the file system. And we emphasized the incident handling use case. In other words, uh, that, that person who is ultimately accountable and responsible for getting a server back up, uh, we drilled down and made sure that uh, this person had the tools by looking at Tripwire report uh, to actually get the server back up. Ease of installation, uh, you don't need to compile anything. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, there's also various internal things that we did to allow us to get some uh, leverage going forward. One is uh, we want to make sure that everything we did sort of took us forward. Uh, customers, uh, you know, we had a 300,000, you know, active user customers. All of them wanted everything now. Uh, it was very important for us to architect things in a way that, you know, we made monotonic progress forward uh, w and we're able to put out releases without having to re-engineer anything. Uh, another sort of value is that, uh, you know, because you know, for certain customers, say an online stock trading site, you know, they demand 15 minute response time. Uh, it definitely pays off to keep this in mind that, you know, you may have a, uh, a critical bug uh, to leave enough hooks for instrumentation so we can quickly diagnose uh, what's going on because, you know, there are, you know, it's our sort of reputation on the line. You know, to give you an idea of where we're going, I mean, uh, this is the uh, Tripwire Tech Console, the Enterprise Control Manager. This is sort of like the centralized dashboard that we're providing. So, you know, for us, you know, we've been beaten up by our customers all year long saying, you know, we can't, it's hard for us to deploy more than, you know, 50, 100 uh, Tripwire, you know, agents out there uh, without some way of being able to monitor, um, control, administer, and manage, you know, these uh, servers from a central location. And so this remedies that. And that'll be shipping in the next couple of months. Uh, that's certainly one aspect. Another aspect is that, you know, we're pr providing centralized reporting capabilities. Uh, so you can actually, you know, we're, we're providing a level of report interpretation that simply didn't exist before. You know, we're doing more than just populating tree control. You know, we're using the severity information, the, um, uh, all this information that you're encoding in the policy language you know, to, you know, leverage when you, it's actually time to read a report. 
I remember the, you know, the 37 seconds you can use up very quickly. So we want to make sure that you know, we provide uh, you know, scope of damage and what the road to recovery is very, very quickly. So you know, this has gone relatively well. I mean, one of the problems, well, I mean, certainly a very good thing is that Tripwire had a, a good reputation you know, over the six years prior to us taking uh, control of the intellectual property in the name. Uh, Tripwire had inherited or earned a good reputation as a reliable tool. <clears throat> and you know, uh, we saw this because it was being taught in security courses. It's mentioned in a lot of books. That also was a problem for us because our existing, or, or what was going to be our paying customer base, uh, may have expectations so high that you know the difference between what they expect and what we delivered, uh, you know, created a gap, and that would lead to disappointment. But uh, you know, our first test visits were extremely validating, and you know, uh, the feedback that we've gotten very strongly is that they were easier to deploy, easy to integrate into business processes, uh, often security. Especially, uh, you know, security, especially in the, the IT area, is just a technology to support business processes. It's not that uh, they think security is interesting in and of itself. It's because they have, uh, they want to mitigate certain risks, and they've been able. They found that it's easy to get Tripwire to protect those critical processes. And an unexpected, well, you know, something that uh, what came out stronger than what we had expected was that you know our customers are finding that. Uh, the existing security staff, uh, say the security infosec people, are, are finding that Tripwire gives them a force multiplier. That you know, once you have you know, the to-do list, you can actually farm that out to every available system administrator. You don't have to have security expertise to you know, contribute to an outage caused by a security incident. So, so that's very good. Um, so we, and you know, by all definitions, you know, we would consider that success. Uh, we sold seven figures worth of um, uh, revenue of the Tripwire product last year. Uh, we're projecting eight figures of revenue this year. Uh, we're 70 people and growing. We've doubled consistently every in size every four and a half months for the last 32 months. Uh, something doesn't, about that math doesn't work quite right, but uh, um, I think certainly in the last 16 months. So goals this year: you know, get Tripwire deployed as far as we can and. Uh, have Tripwire become a part of the infrastructure of you know, business processes. Uh, where are we going? Well, right now, what Tripwire does very well is answer the question, you know, is my server the same as yesterday? Right? And the reason that's so important is that if you take a look at even, say, a firewall, you, know, you invest man weeks, man months, you know, getting this thing exactly right, and then you deploy it. Uh, and then you leave it alone, sort of like, a, say, a router. Uh, you, know, you really don't know if it's the same as yesterday. You want what you need is a certain confidence that you know it's exactly the same as when you deployed it. So we want to expand that to not just servers or uh, firewalls running on Unix systems. We want to protect everything that you know so critical business processes run on. So we're building Tripwire for routers. Uh, we're building Tripwire for databases. Um, you know we're considering say Tripwire for networks. It would be interesting if you knew you could run some sort of program that said oh. Do you know a machine has disappeared or has been added or if the port settings have been changed? Uh, you know, what you want to know is that uh, you want instrumentation and you want visibility and you want to answer the question, uh, you know, is it the same as yesterday? If not, who did it? If it's not one of us, what did they do? The next, so uh, we certainly want to dominate the, the t technology of integrity. Uh, you know, is it the same as yesterday? Where do we go next? You know, I, th I believe it's going to be, is it correct? Right? Just because it's the same as yesterday doesn't tell you that it's actually correct. So sort of leading up to the problems and opportunities and issues around open source, uh, I've grouped the way we're going to allocate resources in the, for the next, say, 12 months into, say, an in-the-box strategy and out-the-box strategy. The inside the box <coughs> strategy is based, uh, some of this problems comes from the innovator's dilemma book that I just gave to SPAF. Is that, you know, the classic way that um, uh, standard product life cycles go is that you end up trying to serve the same customer and deliver higher and higher margins uh, to those customers. And we're certainly going to do that. Uh, certainly, you know, basically those expensive items uh, that are uh, in the data centers that, you know, say, 
Uh, in the case of a stock train site, there are a thousand servers um, uh, in their data center. There were 500 last year. There's going to be 4,000 at the end of next uh, at the end of this year. Uh, so we want to ride that curve. But you know uh, what consistently happens is that if you ignore uh, other emerging markets, you end up missing opportunities or uh, being vanquished by those technologies. Uh, the, in fact, I'll talk about this a little bit more later, but um, in the book Innovator's Dilemma, they mentioned that in the last 25 years, uh, there's been something like a 95% fatality rate in disk drive vendors. That uh, the 14 inch drive manufacturers were clobbered by the 8 inch drive manufacturers which were in turn had their lunches eaten by the five and a quarter inch disc manufacturers who should have seen the three and a half disc uh, manufacturers coming but yet somehow lost to the three and a half disc manufacturers and yet uh, HP tried to envision, you know, uh, break the, jump the curve and build 1.3 inch drive but yet the market never emerged and they failed too. So it's a very interesting phenomena that uh, I don't think people have a very good understanding of yet. So uh, let's talk about some facts and see how this um, uh, affects our strategy. One is that there are a large number of Tripwire ASR customers that cannot or will not buy Tripwire. Um, another fact is that you know, there are probably 300,000 people still happily using uh, the free version. You know, we're hosting off our website, you can download it, uh, but you know, uh, if they're happy with it, how can we you know, get their mind share? Uh, and you know, probably the worst part is, by us shipping a closed source solution, uh, you know, we actually alienate some us users. We have some people, uh, I would say one out of 50 people that I run into, say, at conferences or when I do talks, um, you know, take me aside or you know, they, raise, you know, they raise their hand and say, why did you go closed source? And they proceed to uh, go on about the inherent, uh, the inherent superiority of the open source model. You know, so before, until just recently, you know, this is something I really didn't want to engage someone in. Uh, you know, what I really wanted to know was what is the opportunity. Um, until recently, <clears throat> I'll tell you right now, the way uh, we're treating Linux has some serious flaws. You know, we did try to sell the Linux, Linux product. Uh, it's right, our products right now sell for four hundred ninety-five dollars. Uh, no one bought it. So, you know, we spent a considerable amount of money, resources, shipping that we could have otherwise, you know, worked on some other platform. So, you know, so if we can't sell it, uh, you know, we thought, well, maybe the comparatively advantageous thing to do is give it away. But it still costs money to develop and test. So, uh, problems that we're having with this strategy is that we still make some people mad. You know, uh, just because we give it away for free, uh, they say, you know, they're saying, my God, uh, you're now somehow, well, somewhat evil, or at least more evil than you were uh, when source code was available. And you know, this is a, a bit of a problem because you know, one of the things that was so nice about Tripwire is that it had almost universal goodwill. And somehow us shipping a better version of it, but not releasing source code, has now generated some ill will. There's actually a more serious problem that uh, we ran into when uh, with a switch from the libc to the glibc. Uh, we are, I made the decision to ship a Linux product uh, using the glibc 2.1 uh, in violation of the GNU pub, uh, the GPL, the GNU public license, thank you. <coughs> and, you know, uh, uh, the rationale was that the exposure was very small, uh, that, you know, we were working on ways to get in compliance, but really the risk is, you know, maybe some bad publicity. Uh, you know, I didn't see much downside exposure. But, you know, uh, we did get caught. It's not a big deal, but, you know, uh, clearly it's not, uh, this current strategy is not going to work. So, uh, all in all, this is, for me, pretty awful. We take all this effort to ship a Linux product and all we do is make people mad. Um, Interesting data point, though, is that the, this Linux download is now outnumbering the ASR download by something like 20 to 1. So that's interesting. If they think open source is so great, why aren't they downloading the old version? But that's, uh, that's an intellectual argument, not an emotional argument. <clears throat> so the challenge is to somehow take part or appease or satisfy the open source community 
without sort of destroying something that's working pretty well, right? Uh, and we're projecting great revenue, and um, you know, customers are very happy with us. Um, and you know, we think we can build a real business around this. Should we do what some other comp security companies have done, which is basically withdraw from the Linux market, saying it's not worth our effort, there's no return on the investment that we're making? Or maybe we can actually turn this challenge into an opportunity, and that's something that I'd like to walk through uh, today. Something that this challenge has forced me to do is start investigating the cathedral and the bazaar arguments. In my view, it's not necessarily a closed source versus open source argument. Uh, the claim that you hear so often, and, from, and in fact from some very intelligent people, is that open source is an inherently better way to write software. Open source is inherently a better way, yeah. Um, and you know, to be honest, I don't think that's necessarily true. I'm going to present some facts that uh, I've gathered over the last eight years in relationship to Tripwire and show how that is somewhat contrary to some of the claims that the open source people say. I think the reality is not necessarily whether you release source code or not, but the closed versus open model is a different way of control of content, ideas, and people. One of the reasons why I like the cathedral is that you can control who gets to play in the cathedral. In fact, maybe that's just a generous way of saying the problem with the bazaar is that you can't keep the people out of the bazaar. <clears throat> you know, in the book Code Complete, Steve McConnell says that the top percent of coders are 10 times more productive than the average coder. In other words, if you take a look at their productivity, if you take a look at the number of lines of code they contribute to a project, the difference between the good ones and the bad ones are something like 10x. In some cases, uh, I've even seen this uh, vary as much as 100x. What's the saying that even in the skilled work workforce, uh, your top 10% are performing far more efficiently than uh, the rest of the organization. And that's among the qualified workers. Um, another, sort of, another sort of characteristic of cathedrals is that you know, they will invest heavily in raising the average skill level. One of the hard things about um, you know, working with the bazaar is that you, know, you don't have that leverage. I'm going to claim, or at least propose somewhat facetiously, that maybe bizarre attendees tend to have low skill. Yet, you know, there are some successes with, you know, the bizarre. Um, I actually posted this to the intrusion detection list, uh, based uh, sort of as an addition to uh, a story that uh, Spaff and I published probably six years ago. One of the things that amazes me about open source projects is that, you know, you can have any expectation of support. You know, uh, one person uh, posts to, say, Alt.Security saying, you know, why isn't Tripwire, you know, ported to the Kumquat Mark IV? And for some odd reason, you know, I felt compelled to reply back. And if you think about it, this is a very odd, odd thing. That's like someone walking into a grocery store uh, with some complaints about the way Charmin works and screaming out in the middle of the grocery aisle, uh, who invented Charmin? I demand to speak. Whoever invented Charmin, I've got, uh, I want to know what kind of trees you use, and I've got, you know, 18 brilliant ideas that I want to keep secret that I want to tell you, you know, uh, if you deserve it. Um, and sort of the reality of, you know, the internet and open source is that, you know, people not only tolerate this behavior, they support them and encourage them, and, you know, uh, even if they feel they're worthy, will take you to the inventor of Charmin. So, uh, you know, uh, instead of everyone sort of ignoring this uh, obnoxious, crass person, you'll find one person uh, saying, oh, you know, Gene's home phone number is blah, blah, blah. Uh, you have another person, uh, you know, offering to take notes and, uh, you know, email me the note. And you have another, you know, sometimes you'll even have Bob, the inventor of Charmin, coming out from, you know, behind the fruit stand and actually conversing them and engaging them in dialogue. So, you know, in my view, that's a rather surprising set of circumstances. You wouldn't expect that, uh, say, if you had a complaint about Charmin, they could walk into the grocery store and be able to make a lot of progress in airing your complaints. <coughs> so, how does this relate to Tripwire? Um, I think Tripwire is interesting because it's been around for eight years and it has offered uh, enough or ample time to gather some interesting statistics. I would say there's been 10 contributors who have 
invested uh, or you know, invested some energy in, in significant source code um, attribution, and they are attributed in the README. But even then, you know, the kind of scope is you know on the order of like tens of lines, maybe uh, in the case of Matt Bishop, hundreds of lines. In the case of Rich Sauls, you know, good lord, I mean, he sent me uh, not only revisions but also source code reviews and suggestions, which is very nice. But they represent you know by far the vast minority. Uh, you know, we estimate there's probably upwards of one million downloads of Tripwire. Uh, in the last eight years. So if you take 10 of that, that's actually a very small percentage. Uh, maybe another more interesting statistic is that you know, there have been numerous, you know, maybe 10s, uh, maybe 50s of contributors who sent in revisions and you, you take a look at them and you very politely you know, say thanks, but no thanks, I'll you know, file that away and maybe I'll put it in. You know, um, this is sort of the, they fall into the category of, you know, my good lord, you know, they're not even wrong. They're, you know, you don't even know what they're doing. You know, they took all the vowels out. Why would I want to do that? Um, and but on the other hand, you know, we think there are tens, or you know, we we claim about you know 150 to 300 thousand active users. So, you know, that's kind of interesting, right? A million downloads, 150 thousand users, 50 source code contributors who you know we reject, and 10 that we accept. Um, so if there's a uh, and claim that uh, comes from the open source community that you know uh, you have you can leverage the expertise of thousands and uh, thousands of qualified developers that resource probably hasn't been uh, tapped by the tripwire projects so you know uh, I think it's safe to say that you know when you make uh, a source code tree public it, source code doesn't magically fix itself um, you know source code doesn't magically write itself Uh, help? <laughs> what? Magic? Oh, magically. Thank. Magically is spelled wrong. Fix oh, magically does not fix. Ah, fix itself. Thank you. <laughs> Very good. Okay, big surprise. Uh, you post uh, source code on the web page, and um, nothing really magically, spontaneously happens. It doesn't uh, get better just by sitting there, nor does uh, it grow just by sitting there. Uh, there's a book called Net Gain that actually gives some interesting terminology. He uses it uh, to describe community building, you know, uh, think, you know like portal sites or uh, discussion groups. You have the browsers, users, and builders. And you know, he actually tries to apply you know, what, um, some amount of monetary worth per each category. But I think for, by the time you go from the browsers to users to builders, you, know, you lose orders of magnitude. You, know, you find if you go by the tripwire numbers, the number of builders is, you know, Many, many, many orders of magnitude smaller than the number of users of browsers. Uh, this is. <laughs> so sorry. Uh, I don't know how. All right. Let me try to point out some. I, I, you know, I pulled these numbers out while I was on a plane. God, I wish. Does anyone know how to change colors in PowerPoint? Was that by any chance one of yeah. the uh, yeah, stealth planes? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I think this is interesting. Um, uh, trouble is, it's in the table. Well, oh, this this will do. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, uh, it, it's like this word object. There we go. <laughs> Look at that. It's actually Microsoft Word running inside of PowerPoint as an active active X control. Okay. <laughs> Uh, I think this is kind of interesting. Uh, let me walk you through the interpretation. Um, I tried to compute what the total cost of manufacturing was for the free version, the first commercial version, and the Windows NT version. So the you know in here you have the here you have how many operating systems were supported. So 56 plus is, uh, was for the free version. Uh, how many lines of code? What the estimated cost was? And um, sort of the cost per line of code. So let's go through the 2.0 uh, version. We supported two operating systems, Linux and Solaris. It was about 80,000 lines of code. Uh, why? Well, uh, you know, I think as a sort of way of scaling with the number of developers, you end up breaking things up and you introduce some 
inefficiency there for the trade-off of integration. So that's not necessarily bad. Uh, the total cost is something like about a half a million dollars. And the number of uh, the cost per line is like about five dollars per line. Uh, this is all very, very rough. I could be off by an order of magnitude, but um, you know, it's, uh, it's interesting to see these numbers. For the NT product, one operating system, uh, it ended up being 130,000 lines of code, uh, including research of trying to figure out, you know, <laughs> oh my God, you know, what is NTFS? And trying to figure out how to, uh, um, you know, and it was just like this never ending thing. You know? Anyway, uh, basically, I think 200,000 uh, was a cost to research it. And um, anyway, total implementation cost is over three quarters of a million dollars. Average cost per, you know, the cost per line was something like six dollars per line. All right, let's go to the 1.2. 12,000 lines of code. About $156,000 in development costs if you, you know, uh, quantify, if you uh, used, you know, uh, comp would c consider uh, compensating me or SPAF for my time using, you know, what I call industry rates. And then here's the cost per line of code. So it seems lower than the commercial efforts. However, if you add, you know, the 100 testers, you know, that took part of the uh, beta process and you know compensated them at something like you know seventy five dollars an hour then all of a sudden that you elevate the cost here and you end up with a whoa very similar number with the uh, 2.0 project so it seems to me that you know if you buy these numbers you know that the cost of producing software whether it was the open source by uh, slave labor <laughs> indentured servitude and um, you know, Spass fear of uh, me ruining his reputation by, you know, shipping crappy software. Uh, and the, you know, voluntary efforts that actually do have some value of the community at large. The cost is very comparable to what we do when we build internally. So, I would say it's not, open source efforts are not necessarily inherently advantageous in terms of cost. And since we, you know, one of my previous claims is that the effort, the contributions from the community at large uh, we're actually very small. You know, I, I don't think that changes the picture very much at all. Uh, some more, uh, now here's where the presentation sort of breaks down. I'm just going to start tossing you factoids and possible interpretations. One of the things that's uh, interesting about Tripwire is that, you know, it didn't really magically uh, evolve, you know, like uh, say, well, mm, I'll say like Perl. You know, Perl has probably progressed, you know, it's maybe even, uh, the, um, there's some projects out there who's, owners have changed, you know, um, and, you know, passed around. That hasn't happened with Tripwire. One of the indications is that, you know, uh, there were a lot of sort of unanswered Usenet postings. You know, there weren't any yearly patches. In fact, um, you know, one of the things that I think hurt us is that there was, it was, it became increasingly difficult to compile under Linux. I'm going to talk about that later. Uh, so, you know, that's kind of interesting, right? Uh, without active intervention uh, or a willful act of creation, uh, you know, open source projects can uh, s tail off and, you know, become quiescent. But if that's true and, you know, there's a need out there uh, that gets created as a result that's, or a need that's unfilled, you know, these vacuums tend to get filled. Uh, there's this project called Aid uh, out of Finland, you know, Mtree, they do similar things to Tripwire. And I think that part of that is a result of the perception of cease development in Tripwire. Um, maybe one of the sort of hypotheses or claims that uh, I might make is that maybe the skill level of the bazaar is lower than we had possibly thought, you know, even feasible. Um, you know, I think it is hard enough to build software in the cathedral. Uh, Spaff has this great saying. You know, one of the challenges of writing security software is like it's sort of like building planes when not every one of the people working on it is a pilot. I think that's a very interesting challenge. I mean, uh, that means that uh, to get scalable, to get scalability in the software development process, you need to be able to leverage you know someone's expertise. Uh, I think that the maybe the one of the reasons why we didn't get you know, uh, spontaneous participation in source code development for Tripwire is that, you know, uh, it's even harder to build airplanes when uh, the average skill level of, you know, participants is low. 
good reason to believe that this is true is that you know, the labor market um, you know, in this economy is you know, unprecedentedly tight. Um, you know, there's lots of turnover in system administration time. Uh, people's day is busy enough sort of working on the day job. There's not a lot of spare cycles to work on you know, volunteer projects. You know, perhaps that's another reason. Um, I think the effect of you know, having such a booming economy is that you know, that competes with the amount of free time, you know, leisure time that uh, open source projects would benefit from. You know, perhaps that's the reason. But yeah, see, yeah, this, this has a terrible title. I, you know, yet you know, uh, you know, it's hard to reconcile that with uh, you know the college and university environment. If you take a look at you know all of the open source projects that have been incredibly successful, uh, you know, there's certainly a lot of those. But let me suggest, and I wish if I somehow uh, got the slide clobbered, that you know, if you take a look at where these efforts are being invested in. It's things like MP players, MP3 players, you know, like Winamp. It's going to be things like, um, it's going to be like X-Tank or MUDs. Uh, and I think the real, I think there's some very real truth to that. And I think that also matches where you find the most available amount of leisure time, not leisure time, idle cycles that could be otherwise used. Uh, if you take a look at, uh, so I'll say what I did. <laughs> you know, uh, I certainly had, was busy with schoolwork. At one point, I was taking 21 hours plus graduate courses. Uh, I still really would rather have been working on Tripwire. Uh, I can imagine now. Um, you know, I certainly saw many of my friends, uh, you know, spend 60 plus hours uh, writing multi-user dungeon games. Saw others uh, working on um, X Tank. I would imagine the equivalent now is uh, working on the latest, greatest MP3 uh, player, encoder, what have you. So I think there is a uh, real merit to this notion that you know open source projects can be a real success, but it's probably more of a um, phenomena of where you find people with you know talent and skill and otherwise available idle cycles. I want to talk a little bit about life cycles. <clears throat> You'll find in commercial products the way projects get launched and products get built is that you have to sort of identify or get, you know, uh, identify an opportunity. You know, you're basically saying we think that there's an opportunity here and then you're going to justify that and then codify that and then you're going to commit to it and you're going to, you know, uh, basically spend money on trying to sell it. You know, open source projects really don't have that kind of discipline and resource allocation. Uh, instead, you end up with the fire aim fire aim effect, uh, as Guy Kawasaki would say in Rules for Revolutionaries. Or, you know, they just do it because it's fun, right? Uh, you know, I didn't, well, in the case of Tripwire, I, I did it because I had to. But um, uh, if in the case of, say, your MP3 uh, contributor, they're doing it because, you know, they want to. And, you know, for them, it's, there's no resource allocation uh, process to enforce, you know, certain disciplines. It's just because, you know, uh, they, they enjoy doing it. One of the things that is, came out of the Innovator's Dilemma book is this notion of a disruptive product life cycle. Basically, he's saying in this book, you know, the way to uh, become one of the five and a quarter inch disc manufacturers trying to compete with an eight inch disc manufacturer is trying to duplicate some of the methodologies found in the open source projects. You know, you ship something on a shoestring, but allow enough budget to improve as data comes in. Don't guess where the market is. Don't try to justify it. Instead, ship something that works and then uh, improve it. And so, um, yeah, <laughs> exactly. You know, Microsoft's market, 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 market. Right, but the first That's their life cycle. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, yeah, if you look at Guy Kawasaki's book, there's a... Uh, a table that's just astounding. I mean, it shows uh, basically every release of Windows and shows the additional feature set that's included by each one uh, and basically parallels that with uh, the Macintosh OS. So the Macintosh OS is actually pretty short uh, and sporadic, uh, in you know, in uh, reflecting increased investment and, you know, sort of oscillation. Whereas with Microsoft, they just kept plugging away and something like 12 years later, they had a stable OS. When was that? Not <laughs> right, right, right. Well, let's not be mean. Uh, interesting other factoids. Um, 
Forrester Research estimates that 25% of all enterprise mission critical servers will be Linux by within the next five years. Uh, let me explain some of these bullets. Uh, <laughs> so, written these when I was sleepy. Uh, move these two red bullets underneath here. <clears throat> let me claim that uh, users of Linux are almost by definition system administrators. Um, they have some system administration skill. I know this to be a fact because I recently put up a, well not recently, last, last year, uh, I put up, uh, I turned one of my PCs into a firewall. And it took me like two freaking days. You know, I, you know, I was actually reading through manuals, doing things that uh, you know, I've never done before, you know, screaming in frustration, started over, you know, the whole deal. So I would claim that you know, in order to succeed, you know, successfully use a Linux box, you have to have some degree of system administration skill. What's interesting about that is that you know a lot of these folks will, if they're not a part of industry already, will become a part of industry. And if there's some way that we can earn their goodwill as Tripwire, then we benefit um, not necessarily now, but certainly when they <laughs> enter industry and maybe even become a part of purchasing processes. But by the same logic, users of Windows and Mac OS are all by definition system administrators as well. Because <coughs> I mean, they're doing the same, the same thing. So if you talk about home users mm -hmm. of Linux, yes, you're right. You say most of them are. Yeah, I'm users. talking about hobbyists. However, you're talking about by choice. It's by choice. Yeah, it's by choice, right, the hobbyists. But if you're talking about commercial users of either of those, and you don't, and it doesn't necessarily fall through, I'd say commercial users of Linux are mostly not system administrators because they're using it for things like firewalls. Right. But maybe, maybe I would. Everyone's a user or print servers where it's cheap, a cheap print server. I, I'm trying to motivate open source. <laughs> <laughs> you, you want that. Oh, I mean, I would say I'm that what you're saying that the, the analogy is mismatched. Maybe the analogy is the same as most consumers of cars are not necessarily mechanically inclined, but race car hobbyists are. You said by choice. By choice. Right. <laughs> by choice. All right. Um, well, here's some kind of interesting, you know, carrots um, for open source. Um, you know, one of the things that we may, you know, Linux version of Tripwire might be free, but we still can't ship on a lot of these Linux operating systems because uh, we're not open source. Well, maybe that's interesting because, uh, you know, the, you know, one of the things that Spaff and I mentioned in our papers eight years ago is that isn't it odd that, you know, integrity isn't a function of the operating system by default. Uh, there's another thing that, you know, I guess in the interest of time, I'm not going to mention too bad, uh, mention right now or not much detail. But, you know, I think there's an opportunity for uh, in an open source tripwire that we can grow market for some other type of model. You know, you can imagine, say, suppose, you know, tripwire could serve in, in case of emergency, break, break glass. Well, then the more widely you disseminate tripwire with operating systems, you know, we don't even need to know where the opportunities are. They will find us. Uh, another thing is that you know if we are part, if we ship on the operating system, we can be a part of the build process, which gives us the ability to get um, you know something that's very interesting indeed, which is what should the files on the OSCD look like, or rather, uh, say what should the file look like in the first place? OS vendor can't tell you. Maybe we can. Wouldn't it be interesting to create the equivalent of CDDB, an exhaustive database of all known good files? And you know I think this is. A, a good place to get those signatures is by, through the open source community. Open source risks, you know, to be honest, I tried to spend a lot of time trying to paint risks, but uh, I actually was kind of surprised myself by not being able to think of a lot of them. I'd be interested in hearing uh, some comments, suggestions for this slide. You know, one I can certainly imagine is that, you know, with, with the availability of source code, uh, you know, there is the possibility that someone finds a vulnerability but chooses not to report it. And they will use it to undermine, uh, you know, tripwire, people using tripwire uh, out in uh, corporate America and government, etc. You know, certainly a very real one is that, you know, by giving things away for free, it may, you know, reduce the perception, perceived value of the commercial versions that we're shipping. You know, that's certainly um, one of the things that we fear. What else? I'm mean, very interested. Yeah, you may lose control or something might multiply them. No, oh, that's uh, absolutely a good one. In fact, I'm hoping that with the right 
selection of a, a license agreement, you can actually you know mitigate that. But I'd be interested in talking about that. Well, okay, so that was a very long, meandering way of getting to here. Um, open source involves a lot of fear, um, although one can learn to embrace it. I'm not committing to anything right now, but it's certainly been an interesting thought process. No, one thing of the things that's very clear is that there aren't very many successful models to follow in terms of uh, control of source code. You mentioned something very interesting. Uh, you know, Netscape tried to do it, but you know, when you look at the Netscape's timing, you know, I perceive that as a move of desperation. Right? They were getting uh, pasted by Internet Explorer, and then they said, "Oh my God, where are those thousand magical programmers? Publish the source code," and nothing really happened. Right? Um, you know, there's SendMail, uh, there's you know other sorts of efforts, but you know, all of them are were either I would say unsuccessful or you know too new to really gather any data from. On the other hand, I mean, I believe that there is a scenario where you know uh, an open source tripwire could you know result in success, but I believe it has more to do about correctly setting expectations. As long as you're not releasing source code in the hopes that you're going to tap and recruit you know thousands of magical code elves, but you know uh, you're going to try to achieve some other purpose. And you know one of the things I guess the other concluding uh, point is that you know I think one of the through the facts that I presented, you know, I think one of the, a lot of the successes and inherent superiorities of open source are actually misattributed to expectation management. Uh, you know, I don't think when SPAF and I started Tripwire that SPAF set me down and said, all right, this is going to be the most widely deployed Unix security tool. <laughs> and eight years from now, someone's going to commercialize it. That's that's the bar. Well, no, the bar was, Gene, I'm going to trade three credits for you if you can get this very small task done. <laughs> and uh, you know, because uh, expectations and um, success, at what the measure of success was set relatively low, it actually allowed the uh, tripwire development to take a path of its own and something that I would say has been very successful. That is my last slide. Questions, comments? Tom, of course. Well, I'll let someone else talk for once. <laughs> uh, for, uh, starting, you, you ponder why Tripwire wasn't embraced and things weren't done to it or suggested by the open source community. And I think I have three reasons at least why this, this didn't happen. First, in Tripwire, Tripwire first isn't probably perceived to be terribly sexy mm -hmm. by, the, by the community. That's probably one reason. Uh, and there weren't really obvious parallel development paths for it. When you look at something like Linux, where you talk about you know, getting the great horde of developers um, to come in, there are many parallel development paths all happening uh, that are being merged by Linus and Allen. Um, in that case, that develop completely different parts of the kernel. Um, that's, that's just one reason. They, and Tripwire is nowhere near that. Uh, but on the other hand, I would say less. Uh, you know, the, the paging pro program is not also very sexy, and yet. True, but <laughs> there are obvious performance things. I mean, you, you can. Sure, sure. I mean, there, there are vanity points there, right, for making the pager much faster. By the way, uh, you know, one of the like the number spaff. I don't think you know this. Uh, the I think the tenth beta tester of Tripwire is now the IS manager at eBay. Who's uh, employee number sixty? <laughs> pretty pretty amazing. Those are the things I can think of that you could add to that slide. It's good. Yeah. Are you working on the Windows 2000 type integration, especially with regards to files that span multiple servers? Yes. Uh, you know, we actually handle like all the Windows 2000 features, like encrypted file. You know, we check those attributes too. Right. But when you handle files that span multiple servers. Even worse than multiple oh, multiple I don't servers. know, to be honest. I, I really don't know. If it's... the product to be directory interface. Right. Uh, mm, don't know. Find out. Yeah. Um, one of the things that makes Tripwire a little bit less attractive to Linux users, at least to me, is only supporting uh, Red Hat. Hmm. Which, I mean, yeah, it is probably the largest single distribution, and I now understand that, you know, you're making such a losses on Red Hat, or on Linux's uh, development, 
that you don't want to put more uh, time into spreading it for other ones, but uh, there's a lot of other Linux users. Actually, you know, uh, we did switch to linking statically, and now we run on almost anything. Uh, provided some you know horrible kernel modification that broke you know the uh, file system API, but in doing so uh, we also managed to uh, we are no longer in compliance with the GPL. You, know, you don't need to broadcast that everybody, but you know that's true. <coughs> and I'm committed to getting us in compliance. Uh, actually, just for your amusement, once every four months uh, I get a mail from Mr. Smith. It's locked down something something at hotmail.com, and it's this. Breathtakingly long, you know, critique on Tripwire. It's just, you know, it's great. I mean, someone's investing a lot of good thought. I mean, it's uh, you know, literally written. You know, it's uh, you know, art well articulated. You know, I wish if um, I would rather encourage a more continuous stream of com you know communication rather than this, you know, diuretic, you know, uh, outpouring of you know things. It makes it hard to respond to. But uh, you know, one of the things about the internet is you really don't know who this anonymous you know person is, right? I mean, for, uh, for you know, uh, what is it? On the internet, no one knows you're a dog. You know, uh, on the internet, no one knows that you're actually the you know uh, vice president of product development at Oracle. You never know, so you got to treat everybody <laughs> you know like uh, you know very respectfully. Other questions, Gene. I, I would think that one battle you'd be fighting is that right now the hot thing in industry, to a lesser degree government, between the traditional big three goals of security, confidentiality, integrity, and uh, availability, is mm -hmm. really availability. Yeah. And the, I, I don't know what you're, what you're thinking about is, are you, are you thinking about moving more into this kind of direction? Yeah, actually, um, that is where, that is actually, Everything now, uh, not everything. That's that's the main benefit of integrity. I mean, it's hard to maintain 99.99 percent uptime when someone can crash your server at will, or uh, you know, it's hard to maintain that kind of uptime when. Uh, I mean, this is amazing. Like um, the cost, uh, a bank uh, gave us some outage, network outage costs, and they uh, estimated the cost of six network outages last year cost them something like 400 million dollars. So you know, I did some math, and it comes out to about ten million dollars an hour. So uh, that's, avail that's the availability. If we can chop that in half, you know, we've just saved them two hundred million dollars. Are you looking to RPM? Uh, you, man, you guys are all new. Um, yes, um, it, yes, absolutely. If uh, at, at some point, if we want, you know, uh, to create a room full of love, you know, uh, be you know. Get the yeah, come on back, everybody. We're open source again. You know, I think um, they would like RPM too. Good. <laughs> um, I think we have time for one more question. We can run over it. Anything? Comments? Thank you. <clears throat>